My name is Sabrina Young, and I'm a survivor of the troubled teen industry, and I'm also a survivor of adoption abuse. So I was three months old when I was adopted, and I was adopted in Jacksonville, Florida from the Children's Home Society. I share three adoptive siblings that are not biologically related to me, but they are biologically related to each other. For 11 and a half years, I endured abuse, torture, neglect, racism and mistreatment. My adoptive mother was very cruel and sadistic. We had to ask permission to drink. We had to ask permission to eat. We were not allowed to come out of our rooms. So if it was Saturday morning and she slept in till two o'clock, you stayed in your room. She used to make us sleep in the bathtub as punishment, no blanket, no pillow. She would wake us up by spraying cold water in our faces. When I was nine years old, she waterboarded me with a two liter bottle of ginger ale on our kitchen table because I drank a glass of it without her permission. Oftentimes when children's services were called and, were ca and they came out to our house to investigate, she had a heads up or warning. So then she would prep us like, this is what you say when they ask, what bruise is this from? So we would lie and say, it's from our bike or we fell because she would brainwash us and say, well, no one's going to want you. Nobody wants little children anymore. You're too old to be readopted. You'll get stuck in foster care and would tell us all kinds of horror stories to keep us to be quiet. There were times where she would make me sleep in the hallway. She would call me racial slurs. She would often threaten to take me back to the children's home and trade me for a white child. There were times where she would take us out to restaurants and she would eat food in front of us and we would sit there with nothing. I was around nine years old when it developed cancer and I was sent to live with a friend of the family named and while I was living with her, I was molested when I was 10 years old by one of her adoptive children. When I told them what had happened, she called me to come pick me up and it was never discussed again. It was just swept underneath the rug. I started wetting the bed at night and she rubbed my face in the urine soaked sheets because she caught me trying to change my bed in the middle of the night. She called me Peapot and made me go to school smelling like urine. The next day after that, I get sent to another aunt's house and I live with her for maybe a couple months. My sister was sent to a girl's home first. Well, she was sent to go live with our aunt first while I was living with and then our aunt sent her away to a girl's home in Florida called Charity Haven. A few months later, I come home. My aunt sits me down on the couch and goes, I'm going to send you to a boarding school. And I'm like, yes, Hogwarts, right? It was nothing like it. It was a cult. I was told that I was going to be there with my sister. Little did I know that my sister had been sent away to their sister facility in Alice, Texas. So Charity Haven and Victory Acres were ran by a husband and wife duo, and we were forced to call them Mama Hen and Papa Hen. The majority of my time spent at Charity Haven was in a little cell, like a little room, and on the door, it said a praying girl will quit sinning and a sinning girl will quit praying. The room had carpet from wall to floor with a little pew bench against the wall that was attached. And there was a tiny little closet with a retractable rod. Now, at this point in time, I did not know that the rod was retractable. And I was so upset and depressed and felt so low and worthless that nobody wants me. My biological mother didn't want me. My adoptive mother didn't want me. I'm stuck in this room. I'm going to kill myself. So I took my shirt off, tied it, and tried to hang myself at 11 years old. Well... It didn't work and I fell and they heard the big kaboom. So they came in to see what was going on. And next thing I knew, they came at me with Bibles and they were praying over me and was trying to give me an exorcism because they said I was demon possessed. The first thing that happens when you go to this program is you're given a sheet of rules and you're hooked up with a buddy and you're not allowed to talk to anybody. You have to ask permission to speak. I remember while being in this room, you were, I was put on a punishment called red shirt. And with red shirt is, is you wear a red shirt, obviously. And that was all you were allowed to wear. You were not given the privilege to use certain toiletries such as razors, body wash, perfume, 
deodorant, shampoo, conditioner. You had to wash your entire body, even your hair, with a bar of Dial Gold Soap. A few days later, I remember them coming in after I tried to kill myself, and I was told to get in this van. I did with about 20 other girls and I had no idea where we were going. I had no shoes on, just socks, and they put shackles on my feet. And I'm like, why would they think I was gonna run away? I'd never ran away before. We drove for what seemed like forever and we ended up in Loosedale, Mississippi. And I remember going down this clay dirt road and I see these boys marching in cadence with white t-shirts and black boots and camo pants and I'm like, Okay, they're just trying to scare me, right? They're not really going to leave me here at military school. I'm 11 years old. I'm about 86 pounds. I was met with the drill instructor and the director of the program. They were screaming in my face, yelling at me. I was instructed to do a bunch of different calisthenics. I stayed at this program for a little over a year. I ran away once from the program when I was 12 years old because there was an older girl there who was 16 who used me as her human punching bag. And oftentimes they would pair the students up and make them fight almost Almost like Fight Club. There was a boxing ring and they would watch for sport. I witnessed several boys being drowned in the pond. I witnessed several girls being drowned and resuscitated and they would use smelly salt or cold water to wake you back up. I got so sick and tired of this girl beating on me that I ran away through the woods. And I'm thinking, okay, I need to go to Walmart. I need to get some clothes, some regular clothes because we wore military styled uniforms. I need to blend in with the general public. And I see the Bethel van pulling up to Walmart. So I hide in a ditch. A car comes beside me and an old man rolls down the window and he goes, do you need some help? Are you from that group home? And I said, I am. And I was reluctant to get in the vehicle with them because, you know, it's a stranger. And can I trust this person? I said, I need to go to the police station. He's like, I'll help you. So I trusted him, got in the vehicle, he locks the door, takes me back to Bethel. I received licks that day with a paddle and I was locked in the director's home, in his personal home in a closet. His children would open the door and would taunt me and make fun of me and call me names. One day I get called to the director's house and he goes, you have 10 minutes to pack up your stuff, you're going home. And I was in complete shock as I was running to the dorm to pack up my stuff. My adopted father pulls up in a vehicle. He told me, are you ready to go home? That was the nickname he had given me when I was little. And I said, yes, sir. Got my stuff, got in the car. And it didn't seem real until I seen the welcome to Florida sign. I was only home for about three months. I turned 13 and my adoptive mother passes away. A week after my adopted mother passes away, I come home, my aunt's there, my dad, and they have my stuff packed. And they're like, you're going back to Bethel. I'm like, why? I didn't do anything wrong. Like, why am I being sent back? Well, I didn't know it at the time, but my adopted father had tried to kill himself over death. And so he was being sent away to a mental institution. And my aunt just didn't want the responsibility of taking care of me. And so they sent me back to Bethel. This time I'm I did everything I could to get kicked out of these programs. Like, you think I'm a bad kid? I'm going to show you a bad kid. And so I did. And I bucked the system. I wouldn't do what I was told. And then I met a girl named Alexis. And we became best friends. And she encouraged me to work the program. Like, things would be so much easier for you if you would just do what they say. But I had an alternative motive. So I worked the program all the way to get level up to get what was called on night watch. And night watch is where a few girls would stay up in the middle of the night or a few guys would stay up in the middle of the night in their dorm and they would make sure no one ran away. What did I do? I had the keys and I ran away. Ran away with two older girls. One was 15, one was 16. And we walked for like what seemed like hours from Petal, Mississippi to the nearby town Hattiesburg. And we stopped at a laundromat to take a break because we were so exhausted, no water, just walking. And I fell asleep. And when I woken up, the girls had ditched me. And I was so scared and I didn't know where to go that I actually called the program. <laughs> I know. 
to come pick me up. And so they picked me up. I was literally forced to put my nose in the corner for three weeks. I would stand there all day long and I was only let out probably maybe once or twice a day to go to the bathroom and you had to stand back in at the wall. When you ate your meals, you had to stand there with your tray and eat your food. I remember they dragged me and put me in an isolation room. This room was cement block with a metal bed and it had like a very thin mattress, no blanket, no pillow. And there was a speaker in the ceiling. And once again, they would play these preaching sermons by the director of the Rebecca home and other evangelical preachers and some Christian music. And they would just play it on re repeat and repeat repeat. I remember being directed to go or called out of the room and was called into the director's office and he goes he read a letter that I had written to my family. I wrote a will because I thought I was going to die in these programs and I said I'm going to die in these programs. I made my will and I sent it and surprisingly they mailed it out and I got a nasty letter back from my aunt and from my cousins telling me what a horrible kid I was and that I was ungrateful and that I was making up stories about my mother abusing me. And he told me that you have no home to go go to. So you might as well just get with the program. So the director would often make fun of the fact that I was biracial. He would call me baby nits. And I was forced to pick cotton as a form of humiliation for 12 hours. When I refused to do it, he said, do you know what we do to your kind down here? So I get taken out of the room. I'm talking to the director. He tells me I have no home to go back to. I get put back in the room. And the next day I was told, hey, Sabrina, you're going to go with us to the boys location. We're going to pick up supplies. So we make our way to the boys program and we pull up to the director's home and I get out of the van and I see Ben from my previous program standing there with three girls. That's the same program that my sister got shut down. Oftentimes these programs, when they get shut down, they relocate to a new state with lenient laws and they rebrand and they reopen. Bethel was kicking me out and was literally sending me back to the program I originally came from. So I was there for three to four months. A couple girls ran away. Children's Services comes in. They interview us, investigate us. I stay with a family from the church that we were going to. And I remember having to go talk to um, Children's Services workers. And the next thing I knew, the woman I was staying with said, I'm so sorry, but your aunt is coming to get you. I remember my aunt again coming to pick me up and I'm driving in the vehicle with her and she goes, you better be good or you're going to come home, which made no sense to me. Like, why can't I come home now? What are you talking about? Little did I know she was taking me back to Charity Haven, the first program I was in in Milton, Florida. I was there at Charity Haven for a few weeks and I remember waking up in the middle of the night to four girls singing beside my bed and the director of that program with handcuffs and shackles saying, you can do this the easy way or the hard way, which I had already knew exactly what was gonna go down. So I said, I'll take the easy way. And I get in the van. We drive from Milton, Florida to Devil's Elbow, Missouri to Thanks to Calvary Boys Academy. And I remember seeing the sign. I said, why are we at a boys school? And I was told, you're not allowed to speak unless spoken to. He did not have a place for us to stay in. So we were staying in a big, huge trailer on that boy's property until he was able to purchase land and property in the state of Florida for our new program that they renamed New Beginnings Girls Academy. While I was at the New Beginnings Girls Academy, I was not allowed to shower for three months, even while I was ministrating. I was forced to stay awake at the end of my bunk bed from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. and was only permitted to sleep for one hour a day for three months straight. I was put on half portions, which means that your food intake was cut down. I was not allowed to brush my teeth. The bed that I slept on had nothing but a piece of plastic over it. I wasn't allowed a blanket or a pillow because he said he didn't want me stinking up the mattress. When I finally got to the point where I could not even wipe myself from not being able to shower because of the blood clots, 
I went to him and I said, I need to take a shower. Please let me shower. I can't even wipe myself. It hurts when I pee. And he said, I spoke to my wife and she says that doesn't happen. Well, that pissed me off. So I stole some in shampoo and conditioner and decided to shower. And I said, you're going to have to drag me out. And they did. And then they beat me. I was dragged out of the shower by my hair, pulled into the director's home where they proceeded to shine a flashlight in my eye said I was demon possessed. They dumped a half a bottle of Dawn dish soap down my throat until I vomited. I was forced to clean that soapy bile vomit up. He had four to five other girls singing Christian songs to drown my screams out because he did not want me waking up his teenage daughter that was asleep in the home. And I was 14 at this time. The next day after this happened, I got my sheets back, got my clothing back. I was allowed to shower. And then I was told to go to one of the trailers that was on the property. And there was a lady from Children's Services. And I already knew. Oh, they're hiding the evidence of abuse. That's why I was allowed to shower. The lady says, did they abuse you? And I already know the game by now. So I was like, no. Like they're asking me right in front of the people that ran the program was standing right there. The CPS worker asked me, do you have any family? I told her pretty much, you know, my adopted mom died. I don't know where my dad is. He's in a nursing home. I don't know where my adopted siblings are. And so she said, do you have anywhere to go? And I was like, no. And I remember a program called Reclamation Ranch. And I was like, send me there. Those girls look happy. Little did I know it was the same sh different toilet. That was my last program that I went to. So that was my fifth program, my last program. I went to that program when I was 15 years old and I stayed there till three months before I graduated high school. That program, I was instructed to carry logs from point A to point B, drop them, pick them back up for hours and hours at a time. I was forced to hold other girls down while they were getting punished and beaten. So I graduated high school December 9th of 2004. I moved to Ohio. I meet a boy. Boy meets girl. Girl gets pregnant. And so I became pregnant when I was 18 years old. I am happily married to that same man and I have two children now by him. We've been together for 20 years. I decided three years ago to start going to therapy and I was diagnosed with complex PTSD from the programs and with that I found the courage to write my book and advocate for survivors in the troubled teen industry so I've been advocating for the past three years I had no actual real life skills pretty much the only thing I knew how to do was cook clean and be an obedient housewife that's all I knew how to do. I didn't know how to think for myself. I didn't know how to fill a job application. I didn't know what taxes were. I didn't know how to say no to other people because I was always taught to be obedient. A lot of that has changed in me and I'm more outspoken. I have been working in the field of DODD, which is Department of Developmental Disabilities. I am a caretaker. I take care of people who have developmental disabilities and autism. I've been doing that for the past 14 years. And with that, I've learned about advocacy, which has helped me transition into being able to be an advocate for individuals who are still in programs like I was. Adoption is trauma within itself. Experts have said that it is trauma within itself. The separation from child and the mother is trauma. So every adoptee in its life has experienced trauma in one form of another. Imagine living in a world where you're the only person that you know you're related to. It sucks. I don't look like my mother. I don't look like my father. I don't fit in. I was a transracial adoptee, so I was the only person of color in my family, and that was rough. And then not to mention having a mother who adopted a biracial child and then would sit there and call them racial slurs. So later on in life, I find both sides of my biological family when I was 30 years old. I take this ancestry DNA test, I find my biological mother, and then I find my sisters, and then three years after that, I find my biological father. And he leaves a voicemail on my phone after getting in touch with another relative that we matched with, and they were like, hey, is this your kid? I think this might be your kid. And then he was like, you know what, I did in the 80s have a relationship with a black woman and she was pregnant but that baby died my adoptive mother ran off put me up for adoption came back to jacksonville when my dad saw her she said 
I gave, or she didn't say anything about giving me up. He said, where's the baby? She says, I had a little girl. I buried her in Georgia. She died from heart complications. So this entire time, my dad thought I was dead. And that hurt knowing that I could have had a completely different life raised by family who wanted me. Um, I didn't also know it at the time until later on that when my biological mother moved back from Florida to Louisville, Kentucky, her relatives were asking, where's the baby? And she goes, I gave her up for adoption. Well, my name had been changed from Renisha Renee to Sabrina. My adoptive mother had four children that she all put up for adoption. The eldest was named Renisha Renee and she was given to an aunt and she died when she was seven years old. Then she had my brother to put him up for adoption. Then she had my sister, a relative took her in. Then she had me and put me up for adoption. She named me after the dead sister. So when I went to go be meet my biological mother and I asked her, what, what did you name me? Because I noticed I was adopted when I was three months old. I surely had to have a different name. And she goes, I named you Renisha. And I'm like, after the dead sister? And she's like, well, yeah. And I said, why did you name me after my dead sister? And she goes, well, I missed Renisha so much that I named you after her. And I said, well, you couldn't have missed her that much because you gave me away. And she said, well, I don't regret my decision." Three years after meeting her, she passes away. So then I find my biological father. Turns out he lives three hours away from me in Ohio. I travel down to Jacksonville, Florida and meet my grandma and my sister. I share a sister on my dad's side and take my kids down there and meet the family. They bake me a cake that says, welcome home. I got to meet my sister, my nieces, my nephew, or my niece, my nephew, cousins, aunts, uncles. It was the best feeling in the world of like, finally my people, like my family. So if you're a parent and you're wanting to send your child away to the troubled teen industry, the first thing that you need to do is go to the www.thetroubledteenindustry.com. There you're going to find the history of the troubled teen industry and what qualifies as a troubled teen industry program. When you go to find a program and it says Clearview Academy for Boys, instead of reading their fancy descriptive marketing, you're going to take copy paste Clearview Academy for Boys, go put it in your Google search bar and put abuse allegations. Their PDFs are going to pop up if there are any. We pretty much have done the research for you and it's out there. You can go to unsilence.org's website. They have an archive of all the programs that we have found guilty of abuse, um, neglect, mistreatment. I also name over 350 different programs in the back of my book where children have died and the programs. I wrote a book about my life. It is available on Amazon. It's titled Dear Renisha because it's written in journal form to my sister Renisha. I felt like she was my guardian angel and was looking out for me and probably is the reason why I survived everything that I survived. There's a second edition coming out. I decided to change the cover work on it and use my own original artwork. I use a picture of a drawing that I love well, a painting that I did of me digging a tree stump with a spoon. That was one of the punishments that they made me do at Bethel for falling asleep in class. I had to dig a huge tree stump with a silver spoon. I never got the stump out. <laughs> it's probably still there to this day.